writing craft book on your bedside table? Has it been there for a while? Do you keep meaning to get past chapter two or chapter one or just the first page? Then the Words to Write By podcast is for you. Hi, I'm Renee. I teach composition and creative writing to college students. My background is in poetry, but I'm working on my memoir. And I'm Kim. I'm trained as a science journalist, but now I'm trying my hand at short fiction. Each week we'll be tackling a chapter of some well-known, but perhaps not so well-read, writing craft book. Together, we'll uncover brilliant insights, face the hard truths, and totally disagree when the author is wrong. This is our podcast, after all. And then, we're going to take what we learn and apply it to our own writing. By doing the book's suggested exercises. We're inviting you to read along, or just tune in for the Cliff Notes version. We're committed to improving our own craft, one writing advice book at a time, and we'd love for you to join us. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Words to Write By. Hello, dear listener. So, Kim, what words have you written? Um, I've been pretty productive on two different stories. I'm trying to balance the amount. I was told that Ray Bradbury would work on multiple stories at a time. Sounds kind of nice, because I've got one story that needs final edits for, and one story that needs just to be written. And ideally, I'd like to keep working on both of them, because both have groups that I read for for these stories but I feel like they don't have enough time to do either (laughs) so for example last week I made a lot of progress on the story I'm editing and I got a better version of it out to my critique group but that meant I didn't have any time to work on the story I'm writing and so I had a critique group last night I didn't have anything to read for it because I just never got around to doing it that sounds like you're trying to juggle a lot do you like working on more than one story at a time Ideally, no, but I like making progress on both of them. (laughs) Okay, I see. So when they're both done, you'll be like, look, I got two things done at once. Right, they'll feel really good. So Renee, how about you? Any words written this week? Not really. Not really. This was a lot of traveling. A lot of the weekends are getting booked now, so I'm going to have to find ways to fit the writing in. So this last weekend, we went to Santa Cruz Island on the Channel Islands off of Ventura. I'm on the bow looking at dolphins. It was freaking awesome. I'd never seen dolphins in the wild. It was a pretty magical experience. That was fun. And then right after that, we were at home for 10 hours and we hopped on a plane to Portland. We're looking for a house and we found one, hopefully. But I did write down some ideas. Ideas came to me and I brought my little notebook and I wrote ideas down. I find that I write the ideas down and they sound really good in my head. And then when I come back to them later, I go, oh, that was kind of sad. But I write them down anyway, just in case. So that's about as far as my writing went. Having a weekend when you don't have anything to do is a great way to catch up with stuff. But in the end, you need to manage your time during the week because often those weekends go away or people expect you to have fun during that time and not hold yourself up. (laughs) You know, that's the thing. My weekends are... There's too many expectations for fun. Okay, so in today's episode, we pick apart the story of Ray Bradbury, the writer's lucky breaks, and identify the types of people you need to succeed professionally and financially in your creative endeavors. Then we have fun riffing off Bradbury's amazement back in 1980 that science fiction was being taught as literature in the classrooms, and how things like comic books and video games progress from mere entertainment to art form. Okay, so on to Bradbury. On to Bradbury. What are we on now? We are on chapters six and seven. He doesn't number them, so. We are on the long road to Mars and on the shoulders shoulders of of giants. Give me a summary. What was in the first chapter? The long road to Mars breaks down the story of how he quote unquote made it But it's more of a tribute to the people that guided him along the way. It's clearly not a I am a self-made writer. He does a lot of shout outs. It felt a bit like an acknowledgement section, but with a little more details of why. Yeah, in kind of a story form, like first I met this person and then this person had me meet this person and then it grew. His style of writing is a lot of what ifs. What if this hadn't happened? What if I hadn't met this person? Look at all these amazing coincidences that came together to bring me here. Do you feel like this was all a bunch of coincidences that if it hadn't happened, we wouldn't be reading Brave Bribery now? 
the first few may have been coincidences, but after that, no. So basically, once you got those early stuff, then everything else would have progressed in some way or another. You know, I read enough stories about writers or people who make it. It's usually you make your luck. You put yourself out there enough, you get luckier, and then it's kind of like you meet this trifecta of people, and then all of the pieces start falling into place. And most writers often talk about how much time they spent not having it come together. Yeah. How many rejections, how much time they spent writing things that nobody wanted to read, and then they get their lucky break. It seems to be that kind of story. He was a very dedicated writer, and he was constantly putting himself out there and getting rejected and not caring. And Well, I'm sure he cared, but he was definitely putting himself out there. Also, Ray Bradbury's a very, very good writer. This doesn't seem to give you much information about how to be successful because it's all his successes, right? Yeah, this chapter isn't something you can just follow on your own. It'd be very difficult for someone to go, oh, I just have to wait for an agent to write to me. I just have to go to New York and meet a bunch of publishers. <laughs> that have been arranged to meet me. At lunch. <laughs> At lunch, <laughs> right? So the market has changed quite a bit. I don't think it works out that way. I mean, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think his, his story was pretty unrealistic? Or do you think it kind of works that way now? I think whenever you take successful authors, their stories are going to have a quality of this because everyone that wasn't successful got weeded out. Kind of one of those things that, of course, the evolutionary traits we see today are successful because the unsuccessful ones didn't cause them to reproduce. But I think there's more information in here than a first read would give it credit. He does a good job of explaining what these people in his network did for him and how that helped him achieve financial success and recognition. So let's go through these individual people. So the first person he mentions is Norman Corwin, who he says he was a friend who first listened to me tell my Martian stories. Okay, so this guy is a heavyweight. He was an American writer, screenwriter, producer, essayist, and teacher of journalism and writing. And he was really into radio dramas that Bradbury listened to. And Bradbury sent him some of his stories as a young fan when he was in his teens. And Corwin wrote back and they became friends. And it was like, wow, okay. And furthermore, I think Corwin is a mentor to him. This is a term that gets thrown around a lot. If you're going to be successful, you need to find a mentor in whatever field you're in. And critically in this piece, Ray Bradbury says that Corwin told him that he needed to get himself to New York and meet with these agents. It was a big financial thing for him to do. He took the bus across the country he commented how they had $30 in their bank account and it cost $5 to stay at the YMCA for a week. So it was a big expenditure. Corwin put him in contact with all these different editors to sit down and talk with. And this advice from somebody and support to take risks is really useful for someone because otherwise we're flailing. We have no idea what is it that somebody wants? What is it that agents want? What is it that publishers want? What is it that you need in this cover letter? Or just the way you present yourself. And you can read about this stuff online, but really what helps is for someone that's in the business to take you under their wing and say, okay, here's what you've got to do. Yeah, he got an in. It was an in, but it was also just somebody that gave him really good advice. True. He did give him good advice, although it's not enough to just go to New York. He had a series of people representing publishers to sign him on, like taking out to lunch and asking him questions. So to line that up, you need things in place. This seems to be a little bit prepared for right. Bra on Bradbury's behalf. Right. And he had an agent by this point. So obviously that stuff was working. But the finding somebody that is a certain amount advanced in the area that you're in, but not necessarily someone you're relying on to give you the break, but just to help make connections and help prepare you for this stuff. Yeah. And then we have Bradbury, the editor, no relation. Role do you think this guy played in Bradbury's career? Well, he did two things. One, he wrote the check. <laughs> from Doubleday to sign Bradbury. So the story went 
uh, when Bradley was saying was he started having lunches with all of these publishers or editors from publishers and they kept asking him what he called the depressing question quote is there a novel in you somewhere so I guess before this point Bradbury had not written a novel he was a short story writer and he'd say hey well I have 500 short stories in my backpack I want to read them <laughs> <laughs> they're like ah so a lot of these publishers were not interested in short stories so, as publishers today also are not usually interested in short stories right so what happened was when he finally got to walter bradbury from doubleday the guy said are you sure you don't have a novel and he asked him about those mars short stories he had published and he goes well you piece all those together and you probably have yourself a novel and bradbury was like oh my gosh you're right that's how the novel was born. The guy said, hey, if you send me an outline of your story by, you know, noon tomorrow, then we'll sign you a check. So Bradbury stayed up all night. He wrote this outline, putting all the pieces together of all these like notes and stuff he had for all these characters he'd already created and trying to make them cohesive. And he sent it to them and they wrote him a $1,500 check. Which I did the calculations and $1,500 in that day would be the equivalent of $18,000 today. He said that that was enough to pay his rent for like a year yeah, and put a down payment on a California house. Jeez. I think even more than the $1,500 checks is that he had somebody that could look at his stuff and give him a fresh perspective. And when someone in the industry takes time to look at your stuff and says, this is how I can market it, this is how it can work, it's really good that Ray Bradbury said, yes, you're right, I can redo my Martian stories into a novel. This is a brilliant idea. I'll go ahead and do it. As opposed to, well, no, I don't want to sell it that way. <laughs> you know, I've noticed there's a different kinds of writers, or I've met different kinds of writers over the years. Some of them in, my, in the workshops I've been in are very protective of their work, and they almost don't want to accept barely any advice. They're like, nope, this is how it's going to be. Whereas I'm the complete opposite. I'll be like, just tell me what to do. I'll edit everything. Oh, you didn't like that? I cut it out. I just take every bit of advice, which it's probably not good to be either of those people. <laughs> the problem with taking everybody's advice is that those people aren't necessarily going to buy your stories. The trick of it is when you have somebody that's willing to put the money up to buy the story mm. to take that advice because that has a payoff. I mean, the problem is with a critique group is that everyone comes to their own opinions about what they want and you're not just selling your book to that person. Interesting. I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't thought about ever selling the book. I just thought about, well, this is what the reader's thinking, and these are different kinds of readers, and they want these different things. So how can I please them all? And you can't please them all. That's true. What kind of writer are you, Kim? When you're in a critique group and they're reading your work? I take it with a grain of salt, but if I have an editor that says, I want this, then I make the changes. Yeah. You hear that, editors listening to this podcast? If you hire us, if you give us a $1,500 check, we will do what you say. <laughs> so now we can transition because you were talking about how you have these two mentors here. And then you also have a couple of people that were more almost categorized as fans or people that appreciate his stuff. Not necessarily that helped to make connections or navigate the publisher's path, but were actually very critical as well. And he thanks them. And the first one was Christopher Isherwood. Yes, Christopher Isherwood wrote him his first review of his Martian Chronicles novel. Isherwood became the reviewer for Tomorrow Magazine. The way Bradbury tells the story in Zen and the Art of Writing, which, you know, I'm sure there are certain embellishments, is that he first met Christopher Isherwood and he sold him the book and he made a connection first and foremost and then the guy said I'm gonna write about you in my first column so it wasn't just that somebody picked this up and decided to write about it it was a personal connection made first that then resulted in this incredibly good publicity to get a review in a science fiction magazine it was a little happenstance I mean this guy Christopher Isherwood knew Bradbury was at a Santa Monica bookstore signing copies of his book it wasn't a random person he ran into. He obviously knew Bradbury's work through other short stories. But if Bradbury had been a jerk to him or been like, you know, I'm the important writer right. and you're just here for my signature, he might not have made that connection. Right. Which is another good lesson for you, dear listener <laughs> and dear writer. Don't be a jerk at your book signing. And then that led to a connection with a professor named Gerald Hurd. Yes. Henry Fitzgerald Hurd. He was a historian and a science writer and an educator and a philosopher. He was the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. Kind of rando. 
He was a mentor and like knew a lot of big people like Aldous Huxley. Aldous Huxley was not just a big writer. He was a famous writer at that point. Yeah. Had written, um, what was his? Wasn't it Brave New World? Brave New World. So yeah, this guy was a big deal. And he apparently, Bradbury had no furniture in his house. He said, we just moved. And if this guy comes over to talk to me, he's going to have to sit on the floor. And Gerald Hurd said, that's okay. <laughs> so he came over and they gave him the only chair they had. And then him and his wife, Bradbury, sat on the floor. So serendipity, right? <laughs> it's interesting because you were talking about archetypes. It seems to be the same type of people that you meet that get you there. When you listen to stories of people who have made it, there's always like these archetypes. The agent, the publisher, the reviewer, the philosopher, and then I wrote the lunch, quote unquote. <laughs> there's always a story of a lunch. The lunch. How do you get that lunch? We probably don't have agents writing us in today's day and age, but maybe they do. Maybe they catch us on social media. And they email us. I don't know. It hasn't happened to me. They also didn't have social media back in Bradbury's day. They just had being social. They just had being social. But yeah. Um, next chapter then? Next chapter. This one I found to be the least writing advice so far. But I found it to be a wonderful little time capsule because Ray Bradbury is saying, can you guys believe it that science fiction's actually being taught in the classroom now? Would you have imagined 10, 20 years ago that anybody would have given science fiction and fantasy the time they, but now people are reading it and children who never read anything are reading it. It's amazing. And, and we come from a generation where everyone's read for Fahrenheit 451 in high yeah. school. Yeah. It's assigned reading. <laughs> this is aged like milk, as they say on the internet. I remember when I was going to conferences and stuff in the beginning of my teaching career, the big debate was comic books. You've got expertise in this. <laughs> what he's observing here is something that happens, is that there's a form of entertainment that then is elevated to art and worthy of study. Obviously, the best example for our current time is comic books. You actually were in the fray of this as comic books were being more accepted in. Yeah, well, part of it also was there was just some damn good comic books that came out. It was almost like they had to be taught. One of them was by Jean Yang, American-born Chinese. It's just this wonderful book. And then there was also Persepolis, Old Mouse. And that was old. That was back when you were in high school. I actually did read it in high school. But we had a hip teacher. In the beginning, I remember it was very much, should we be teaching comics in the classroom? And I'd go to conferences. And I even myself presented on teaching Watchmen in the classroom. I did a couple of presentations on that one. But now the conversation has switched. Now, keep in mind, if you've been listening to this podcast, you know me and Kim are super geeks. We're old er geeks, <laughs> older geek women. <laughs> so all of the presentations I've done for composition conferences have been geek related because I'm not going to put my effort into something that isn't. The conversation has switched. Now it's video games. I know. And that's new enough that it kind of boggles my mind. It's very easy for me just to ca categorize it with mindless entertainment or at least just entertainment. I see my kids playing Zelda Breath of the Wild and it's very pretty, but I'm not entirely sure how it qualifies as an art form or if it would qualify as an art form. I wouldn't necessarily teach that one. There are some, though, that have enough literary merit that warrant writing an essay about and discussing the literary, literary elements of. So I do teach one, and I have given a presentation on this. I called it Strung Out on Lasers and Slashback Blazers. <laughs> Assigning video games as a text in the classroom. Oh, that so, sounds so official right there. Yeah, well, you know, you have to have the fun title, and then you have to have the official title. So in this presentation, I talked about the two video games I taught in my mythology class. So one's called Never Alone. It's very much like Super Mario, where it's like, I forget what it's called, but it's like, it's a scroll. It's a scroll. Yeah. But then after you pass each level, there's interviews with indigenous peoples, Eskimos. It's really cool, but it's every level. And then you get these videos of interviews, like Eskimos. real life interviews. Yeah. Like go straight to video. And you know, there's these people 
being interviewed about their culture. And how does that reflect back on the video game itself? Or how does that? Um, you're going through, there's a fox helping you or a wolf. I can't really tell. That takes you from one level to another and you're just trying to save your community. The plot is rather thin. But it did work for your classroom. How did you teach it? Well, I was teaching a mythology and folklore class. Interviews with indigenous people and their stories and stuff. That That's why I did it. Also, you don't hear a lot about, you know, Eskimo culture. When you teach mythology, world mythology is gigantic. I made a point to steer away from the Western stuff as quick as possible because it's everywhere anyway. It's a world mythology class. I want to focus on stuff that they probably had not heard of and to draw attention to as many different cultures as possible. Getting actual indigenous people talking about their stories and their culture, I thought was very valuable for students learning mythology. And it's presented in a different venue, just like comic books present the images along with the text. And therefore, people might be more open to reading comic books because they're processing the visual information. Here, the games put you in a different mindset too, because you're actually interacting with them. And then suddenly you're getting these videos. Yeah, in this one specifically, you become the protagonist because you are moving the protagonist around. You are participating in the goals of the protagonist. Never Alone is okay, but the one I thought was incredible, which after I found it, I only taught that one, was called Year Walk. And it's a bit dated. It, it, it's a little creepy. I'm afraid of horror stuff, so even I had to be a little careful with this. But it is incredible. The arts won a bunch of awards. It's based on skateboarding and folklore. So you are the protagonist that is going to go on a year walk, which you starve yourself and you deny yourself water so that you hallucinate in a cabin. There's these different creatures from mythology that come around. There's a water horse and you bring them the souls of dead children and they make a really creepy sound when you're dragging them around. It, it's really creepy anyway and it's a really sad story. It is an amazing game because it's first person and you are learning essentially the goals of the protagonist as they do. Mm -hmm. And you just get wrapped up in this story. You adopt the goals. And so that's like the next level of participating in a story. When you're reading, you're identifying with the protagonist. But are you the protagonist? Not really. Unless I guess you use the second person pronoun, <laughs> which is tacky. <laughs> but in a video game, you just added this new element. You are the player. You are the actual protagonist in the story. And that just adds another level because in mythology, the people were their stories. Right. You have to take on the beliefs. And in a video game, the beliefs are real. Yes. So you're experiencing these myths as if they were real, which is how they were originally communicated. Exactly. Here's the thing. A course in mythology is not just a course in learning who all these gods were and what they represented. It's about storytelling. We are a storytelling species. And this is how we move through reality. We don't move through reality in what's in front of us. We do it on a fictional basis. I kind of wish I could take your class. Oh, thanks. <laughs> As you were talking, it made me think I did actually play a game that felt similar. I played this game called Unpacking, which is a pixel art game. You're the protagonist and all it is is about going to different locations and you open your boxes and you fill in your room. I won't say it's first person because you click on boxes and you just move stuff around with the mouse. So it's not a physical moving of everything. But as it progresses through a series of rooms and you learn who this person is by the objects that she keeps and the objects that she gets rid of. You know you're female because you have to put away the bras. I was about to say, can you give me an example? Yeah. You also have to put away tampons and stuff like that. Oh, that sounds like a great game. <laughs> And she's an artist, so you have her various art pieces and some of the things that give her inspiration. She's a geeky woman. She's got video games and poster, obviously some fantasy books and little figurines from the various series and stuff. But then you're also seeing how she progresses in life. First room is your kid's room and then it's your dorm room. And then it's moving with a bunch of other girls 
and figure out how to put your stuff amongst their stuff. And then you get a boyfriend and you're in this like really swanky apartment and you're trying to figure out how to move his stuff around so you can fit your stuff in. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. And then the next one, you're back in your parents' house. Because it didn't work out. You know, at the same time, when you're putting stuff away, this guy's stuff, like, honestly, a lot of this stuff was kind of cool, but not necessarily the right fit. You could almost feel like, I, I'm not surprised it didn't work out. Well, wait a minute. Are you spoiling the whole game? I told you to play it earlier. I <laughs> But did. anyway, and there, there are a couple more stages. I won't spoil those, but I found an emotional connection. And there was a point where, yes, I started, so I cry really easily. Cheesy movies, I'm totally a crier. But the game got me to cry. That's cool. Yeah. They could have written that story out. People have written that story. And I might have even cried with the story. But experiencing it was a different thing. So, yeah, I think in 20 years time, people will be saying, yeah, do you remember when people wouldn't accept video games in the classroom? That's true. That's true. You also have a higher chance of engagement. Right. And this is something Bray Bradbury brings in. The line is, suddenly kids that were never readers were reading and contributing. <laughs> Well, that's what they said about Harry Potter. Yeah, that's yeah. what they say about everything. So I've got one other question to finish this up. In your opinion, because with your education background and expertise, do you think that it's a matter of there being a form of entertainment and then suddenly a couple individuals working with that entertainment creating amazing products that then are recognized by the powers on high and then it trickles down? Or is it more like Bradbury said, like the kids were reading science fiction and they kept pushing it at their teachers and eventually the teachers read it and they realized it was good so they started teaching it and then it rose up hmm. i guess it, it depends i think when it comes to pop culture the young people come along the young people read those comic books and then it gets more mainstream how it gets mainstream is the key right i think it's mainstream when producers realize they make money off of it exactly it's so you need money. the audience first Right. You need the audience first, then it's money driven, then it's marketed. And it becomes popular. We're taught now as teachers to find things that are relevant to our students. Don't just give them the same thing from back in the day when I would still get handouts that were photocopied, but clearly they had been typewritten 20 years prior. You know, we don't supposedly do that anymore. Some teachers still do that. This is another gardener rolling over his grave moment, isn't it? It is totally... <laughs> <laughs> Another gardener rolling over his grade moment. I think any time somebody raises the bar, like I guess Hamilton, although I have not seen it, doesn't that raise the bar? It's like, oh my God, somebody took something that was just pop culture and they really kicked its butt, you know, and now we cannot ignore it anymore. When something is written so well that it cannot be ignored. With the irony being that Hamilton is based off a fairly academic, in detail, biography of a founding father right <laughs> so yeah. if you had to vote on something that you think we'll be talking about in 20 years time games i think vr games yeah are going to be huge as you were saying the thing about games is that it allows you to experience these elements in a way that books and other things and movies and tv can't and i think vr is going to just merge with that yeah I think it's important to understand that it's very hard to manufacture learning experiences like this. When they get reverse manufactured, they rarely work. For example, I did once try to include a quote unquote video game that taught grammar skills. The students saw right through it. They were not having it. They're like, this is not a game. Like, this is not a fun game. This is a boring game. So, just because it's cool doesn't mean it can be transferred <laughs> or just because it's fun in one sense doesn't mean that it can be transferred, which is where you get the people that elevate it. The people that know what they're doing, they can elevate it to something that is literary or interesting. But the next thing in line, uh, what other media can we have? I mean, social media could be. I mean, how would we like start breaking down tweets? Someone's written a Twitter novel, sure, right? Some people have written Twitter short stories, yeah. I mean, that, that could be taught, I suppose. Reality TV is an art form. Oh, God. I mean, that would be great for an editing class, I suppose. Or if you had someone that was 
as dedicated to their art form that they were actually going to create reality TV that... <laughs> I I don't know. I would have a hard time teaching that because I myself do not like reality TV and I would feel almost offended having to take a class. But I think what it takes isn't us philosophizing about how it would work, but some really amazing genius grabbing it and turning it into something else. Because once someone made Mouse, it suddenly became apparent of how well graphic novels could show the experience in visual format to connect with us on such a level. Once someone started making these video games where you could experience these things, suddenly it became possible. Some of these entertainments still don't have the creator that's going to push them to the next level. True. And it won't be us. It will not be us. No. Back to this first chapter where... Bradbury describes these individuals that had so much effect in his writing career. This is a weird chapter, right? Because what do you do? What what activity can you do with all of these what ifs? What I thought when I was reading through this is, how would I build my own network of people like Ray Bradbury did? I decided to go for the the first stage because I have a couple stories written. I don't have anything published. I'm obviously not going to meet with a publisher or contact an agent, much less develop super fans that would promote me. But what we could do is we could look for a core whip. Oh. Like a mentor. We're like, we're fans and we send them an email? Yeah. I'm sure that Ray Bradbury didn't start by sending the guy a copy of all his stories. He probably right. started by writing to him and having that guy write back. Huh. So what, like I find my favorite poet and I'm just like, you were awesome and inspirational. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. How about this for a challenge? My mother would love this. It's like writing thank you notes, you know? I never do that, but <laughs> I should. I know I should. Right. But what if, as a practice, when we find something we like or we have some things that we've been liking in the past, we actually reach out to the creators and tell them we like them? So we would find other authors or how far can we go? Can I like email a podcaster? I think so. The trick is get into the habit of doing it and building up relations. I know some people have done this over Twitter, basically by responding to somebody you like, tweets, you respond and you get back. And the people have actually built full networks of people through Twitter, but I don't really use Twitter. So I do know how to use email and I do know how to find people's email addresses. Uh Uh-huh. So for the next week, until we meet again, we identify people whose art forms we respect, and we send an email, and then we'll get back together next week and say what the results were. So they might email us back. They might email us back. Whoo, this is, this is scary, but invigorating. I both love and loathe this assignment, <laughs> but I will do it for science. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is a great activity, Kim. Yeah. A little bit outside my safety zone, but not so much that I won't do it. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? They don't email you back. Exactly. But if they do, whoo, whoo, that would be exciting. I'm going to get a little rush of adrenaline every time I press the send button this week. (laughs) (laughs) Fight or flight. Oh, what have I done? I think it's important, dear listener, if you do this with us, that you're very respectful and don't just send them your work. Just be cool yeah be cool yeah okay let's be cool let's be cool for science and we're back after a little more of a week of writing daily to people we're interested in that's what we did right renee uh (laughs) sort (laughs) of mostly yes but of course you know there was a little of waiting to the last minute deadlines are always good Yeah. Did you write to the last minute or did you start early? Well, I started early and then I took a break and then I wrote at the last minute. (laughs) Who did you write to? I wrote to several different people, but even before we started this assignment, kind of as a lark, for some reason, I decided that I would reach out to a journalist named Jess McHugh. On a previous Bradbury assignment, we were going to be reading nonfiction and such. And so I found a collection of essays in a almanac. And I was reading that and I was curious about what other almanacs are there out there or what exactly are almanacs. So I went searching and I found this article by this person and I read it and I really liked it. And I decided on a lark to just email her and thank her for the article. And you, who did you contact? One of the people I contacted was Kij Johnson. She writes speculative fiction. The reason I contacted her was because I had a personal kind of 
connection. Like there was a story behind one of her works in my life that I thought, okay, well, that would warrant me emailing her. It would be genuine. It would be like, hey, genuinely, I really like your work and this is why. Mm -hmm. Max, my husband got me a book probably like seven or eight years ago. It may have been because of the cover, I'm not sure, but it was called At the Mouth of the River of Bees. The title also was pretty amazing. It was a collection of speculative fiction. And that is how me and Max connect a lot. We really like sci-fi and fantasy and all that stuff. We like to read the same books and talk about them. And so he got me this book on a lark, like he said. He thought I would like it maybe. He didn't know anything about it. And I read it and I was like, oh my God, the imagination required to write these stories is just amazing. And so I put it to him. I said, hey, I'm done with this book. You need to read this book. And he read it and he is an avid short story reader of sci-fi and fantasy. And he said that that was the best short story collection he'd ever read, which is a tall order. And yet, despite all this, you didn't think to reach out to her until just now. Right. I mean, I don't know. Just like we imagine what the author is like, or we have this idea in our head of this person who wrote these things. But to me, it didn't go any further than that. A few years later, Max got me some eBooks of hers. And one is the sequel to The Wind and the Willows, which I had forgotten all about that I had it. So now this is great. I emailed her and now I'm like, I'm going to read that because I just read The Wind and the Willows last month. Nice. So that's the story of why I emailed Kish Johnson. Did you get a reply back? Actually, I did. I got a reply fairly quickly. Mm, Yeah. I got a reply back. I noticed that she had a book out. And so I went looking for the book and found it in the library. And then I emailed her back saying I was interested in reading her book and telling her the almanac that I was recently reading. And she said that she'd add that to her collection. So yeah, it was a little back and forth. It wasn't anything more than a couple of lines each way. I didn't want to be intrusive, but I was thinking from the perspective of a journalist that so many people read your stuff. So few people comment on them. So fewer people actually reach out to you. So I kind of got the feeling that it was a little positive bump in her day. Look, somebody read my stuff. I liked it. Yeah. I guess there's a spectrum, right? J.K. Rowling probably got 5 million fan letters a day or something crazy. But to the person who writes news articles or whatever, I mean, it could be kind of lonely, I'm assuming. Yeah. And you spend a lot of time working on a particular story and then it's out the door and then you're on to something else. And It's kind of like it almost disappears at that point, even though technically it's still on the internet, but it's no longer front of a magazine. It's kind of neat to realize that your stuff is actually out there and people might still be reading it and getting something out of it. Yeah. And the rate we consume articles and stuff, you put them out there in the ether, people get a quick read and then do they come back to it? Right. When they were actually in newspapers or in magazines, people held on to the magazines for a while. Maybe somebody would cut it out and I had a grandmother who used to send cuttings from magazines and articles to us whenever she sent letters with things underlined. Really? That's actually kind of cool. I like that. (laughs) Yep. She would go through the Wall Street Journal and she would- The Wall Street Journal. She would go probably to the library to get them copied. And then she'd have things like her little scrawl writing on it. And then we'd never read them. But you know, it was the thought that counted. Sometimes we'd read them. All right, but that's still sweet. I like that. Mm-hmm. It was much more personal than the, I'm going to send you a link from an article I like sort of thing. Exactly. Do you think you gained anything from this? First off, like you said, makes you consider the author in a different way as opposed to just this far removed person or you have the work in front of you and you think that's all there is, but there was actually a human that wrote this and made decisions and came up with ways of doing these things. And you know, struggled to get other people to agree to publish their stuff. So this makes us aware of the other writers out there and just humanizing them as opposed to just this, like you said, person on high that doesn't pay attention to these things. I think it's a good mind shift that this exercise gives us. Yeah. I was careful with who I thought, like there were some people I thought I would maybe contact, but they were so big that again, they're not going to get read. But it's not that it wouldn't be genuine. Some people are like, oh, this famous writer is really influential to me and I really want to write them. And that might be good for you. I think we were specifically going after people that might 
read, might reply or might actually get a kick out of seeing someone write to them. But just the act of gushing about someone's work or identifying why it is that you like something can make the work more meaningful for you too. Like you said, the short stories you're reading, you know, were early ones that you and Max had read together. It increases the enjoyment. It's like talking about a movie after you've gone and seen it. You spend $15 on a movie ticket and that's two hours, but afterwards, if you get like three or four hours of conversation, it increases its value. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason most people don't go see movies alone, at least on the big screen. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, the conversation, that's part of the community, right? But it's, it's like, how do you join a community, especially when you're locked up because of COVID? How do you like make an email feel genuine? (laughs) And I think that's something we'll address in the second half of our podcast on our Patreon account. Which, as a perfect segue after this conversation, why don't you tell everyone about Patreon? All right. So everybody, we have a Patreon page. If you didn't know, we got two tiers and there's chapter notes. I very thoroughly go through and post them, but we also have activities for people to respond to. And you can join our community. We were talking about community in this podcast. And if you're struggling to find a community of writers that give you feedback or at least talk to you and help network, we've created a space for that because we know how important that is. We've created a space. You can go on there and there's some for the public. You can go on. You don't have to be a Patreon member to respond to our posts. And we promise we will respond back. And that's very valuable, I think. Yeah, definitely. And then also for listeners, if you want to support this podcast, our podcast is up on Apple and Apple allows reviews. And we got a review this week. We did. Job L22. Unique, engaging, and valuable. I started listening and have enjoyed every episode. Aw. That's kind of like our little bump of happiness that somebody liked our podcast. Right. This is one way to engage. You don't have to email somebody. Sometimes if there's a forum or a post. You know, so if you could go on to Apple podcasts and leave us a review, if you've been listening and you enjoy it, let us know. It's a lonely job. Some, well, it's not super lonely because I got Kim, but it can be kind of lonely. We're not sure if people are listening or we're not sure how people are feeling about the podcast. So it'd be really great for us. Be a nice little boost to our egos, you know. Right. And the other thing for boosting our egos, we also make the announcement of our new podcast on Patreon public. Basically, there are spaces to put comments underneath that. So if you ever like an episode and you want to specifically comment on that episode, you can go to the Patreon site and comment on that episode. Yes, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. That would be great. And as always, if you have a writer friend, we would love for you to recommend our podcast to them. Yes, please. I think that's all for today. That's it. We'll see you in two weeks. See you in two weeks. Bye. Words to Write By is produced by Renee Nelson and Kim Smita Adam. Our theme music is Roll Back the Carpet by Cool Cat Music. Have a great day. Edit that out. (laughs) Pretend I said nothing. (laughs) 